Praise be Jesus Christ, and welcome back to CarmelCast. CarmelCast is a production of ICS Publications. For more information, you can visit our website at icspublications.org. And uh, this season, we're preparing to celebrate the 150th birthday of St. Therese, which will be on January 2nd uh, of this coming year, 2023. And so if you're watching uh, right now during Advent of 2022 or early in uh, 2023, uh, we have a great sale going on right now at ICS Publications where you can buy uh, all of the works by and about St. Therese for 40% off. So it's a great deal. I really encourage you. uh, Now's a great time to really um, dive into the spirituality of St. Therese. And in this season of CarmelCast, what we're doing is we're going through each of the works of St. Therese uh, the writings um, that she, different things that she wrote during her life and examining them and what they reveal about her spirituality. And in the first episode of the season, we had Father Mark Foley. He talked with us about Story of a Soul, which is St. Therese's autobiography. I think so many people have read that work. Um, it's really a spiritual masterpiece. Um, but this episode now, we're going to dive into something that I think is much uh, rare in a sense, kind of like a, a, a hidden diamond in a sense. I I think just as significant, at least in my own life, um, and that's the letters of St. Therese, the letters that she wrote during her life. And so we're very privileged to have with us today uh, Brother Isaiah of the Holy Face. Uh, Brother Isaiah is a student who's studying uh, at the seminary at St. John's in Brighton, Massachusetts. So, Brother, we're so happy to have you with us. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I'm glad to be here. Yes. Yeah. So it'll be good to hear um, your perspective on these letters and kind of uh, the ways that they've touched you in your own vocation, in your own life. Um, Do you, I guess maybe we can start like, um, what, what are Therese's letters like? Just in a more general sense, I guess. Sure, sure, yeah. So starting generally, these books here, um, these are published by ICS in 1986. And what they are is a correspondence of St. Therese. So that means that they include not only letters that St. Therese wrote to others, but letters that were written to St. Therese. Um, and also they even include what they call diverse letters, which are um, ones that were written neither to or from Therese, but have a significant um, information about her. So maybe from one sister to another, um, and they they reveal important information about Therese. That's that's important that um, it's a correspondence because what you get is the whole context in which Therese lived through these letters. They're really like... um, a testimony to her lived experience and the movement of grace um, in her life. So you see, they begin, um, there are letters here from before Therese was born by Therese's mother, Zaley. And they begin with Zaley talking about her baby who she's expecting. And so if you read those first, um, you get a sense of the, the difficulty that was there even before Therese was born. Um, and the struggles that her parents went through to ensure that she survived because Therese was, um, as an infant, was near death because of, because of infirmity and illness. So you read about how Zaley prayed um, especially hard to St. Joseph for his intercession. Um, and then you fast forward and you find Therese's first letter that she wrote, which Pauline, her older sister, um, basically sat with her and wrote with her because Therese was just learning how to write. And it's a very simple letter to one of Pauline's um, friends from boarding school. And it just says, I love you and I'm your friend, even though I've never met you. Um, It's very sweet. But then you can walk step by step through Therese's life all the way up until her death when she could no longer write for, for a short time before she died, when she could no longer write a letter. Um, and including after her death and letters about people mourning her and people um, grieving the loss of Therese. And so it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful journey through her whole life. And you get to really get to know the important people in her life. 
I think that's so endearing, that idea of her sister kind of guiding her hand as a child, because I think yes. that's something all of us probably did, you know, with our parents or siblings growing up. Yes. And I think that kind of summarizes for me a lot of what these letters do is this correspondence mixture is very real to me yes. in a way that maybe I, I've found it a little harder to relate to her in Story of a Soul. But here you see just the the, the basic kind of daily Yes. experiences and Tres is not always writing you know like story of a soul sometimes she's writing about the heights of you know the spiritual childhood but then in these letters she's writing about sometimes the very lowly kind of simple things of her daily life yes it's true a lot of them a lot of them are mundane there a lot of letters are just you know um a happy feast day to to you know her sister on her name's day and just simple letters um but you can see you get there you know, just uh, you, you feel like you're close to Therese and how, how she lived and what was important to her. So if you if you read Story of a Soul and you enjoy Story of a Soul, this is like this is just a wonderful um, supplement to Story of a Soul. And also some of the letters really include great doctrine, too. A lot of them, a lot of them are mundane and ordinary, um, but a lot of them are also profound. And you can you can see how the profound spirituality that she taught was taught always in a context of some need. For mm -hmm. instance, um, one, one good example of that, I think, is that when Therese was a novice, so when she was still very, very much in the beginning of her life in Carmel, um, that was when her father, um, Louis Martin, St. Louis Martin, um, suffered his uh, mental illness, mental breakdown, and he had to be admitted to a hospital in Cain, which was which was, um, you know, for him to go to a strange place. And Celine had to go with him. She wasn't in Carmel yet. And Celine was in great distress, obviously, because their father was, was suffering greatly and um, just a very terrible... Um, they, it, they, weren't, they didn't understand as much at that time mental illness, and there was still a lot of stigma around it. So Therese sends beautiful letters to Celine consoling her but also trying to strengthen her to say that this is to to find how God's providence is working in all of this and she she does so very wonderfully she she does so not sugarcoating anything she admits that it's very terrible but she says that this is the suffering that Jesus gives to us and it's it's from his hand it's not it's not outside of his control and so that way she she herself coped with her father's mental illness and she helped Celine cope with it too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great example. I think it shows to me how um, God ordained in, in Therese's life, even though she could have had no idea, but each of these experiences of her life um, was allowed by God in order for her to teach us too, because we experience like those very same things in our own lives. Yes. And um, Therese has something to teach us, I think, in that, in, in her own very simple and like, um, yeah, just loving way. Yes, yes. And I think I've heard a number of people um, say that they, they, they don't find much affinity with Therese because of the, the sugarcoating of her language, how her language is a lot about flowers mm -hmm. um, and a lot about being little. And for some, that, that, can, be, that can be unappealing. Mm -hmm. But I think when you look at her life, um, the events that happened to her, um, the underneath the sugar-coated surface of her of her language, which which she was a young woman. I mean, she died at she died at twenty four, and she used sugary language, no doubt. But underneath that, there is a deep core of spirituality, mm -hmm. which is profound and which makes her a doctor of the church. And it's what enabled her through the various trials of her life to to find Jesus and to grow closer to him in love. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and maybe you can say a little something about, um, well, just what strikes me about how these are such a, a treasure and that have kind of, they were hidden for a time. Mm -hmm. And really they're kind of more um, contemporary discoveries in the, in the spirituality and the spiritual writing of St. Therese. They weren't, weren't available right away. So maybe you can say a little bit about that and maybe like why that was the case. Mm -hmm. And then I think that has an impact on why they're important to us today too. Sure, yeah. Yeah, so there was a process by which these came came to be published. Um, a detail, a long detailed process, which um, for anybody who, who has these books, there's a, a wonderful introduction 
in uh, volume one by by Father John Clark, and he he outlines the the process by which they came to be published and published in English. Um, so part of the difficulty was, of course, letters are the letters are coming from different sources. Mm -hmm. Actually, it's interesting to note. Um, this is the whole. This right here is the whole of Teresa's correspondence that we possess, um, and if you, it's it's a lot to read through for one person to read through, but compared to some of her contemporaries, it's not very much. Mm. John Henry Newman lived at the same time as Teresa, and if we had his correspondence here, we'd be up here. <laughs> yes. he was just a different. He had a different role mm -hmm. in life and in the church. Teresa only wrote to twenty six people in her lifetime. And 75% of her letters are to her own family members, her sisters, her father, and her cousins and aunt and uncle. And so that's 75%. Another 10% is sisters in Carmel with her. Mm -hmm. So just inter-monastery letters, not, not using the postal system. Right. And then another 10 are random ecclesiastics that she had infrequent contacts with. Mm -hmm. um, so you had to, in publishing these, you had to gather all of those. And fortunately, the, the Guerin and Martin families um, were great compilers, so they kept, they kept things. Um, but the thing was it, was, it was not immediate that, they, um, that Therese's family members let that information out to the public. Mm. That required um, a lot of discussion. And certain um, Theresian scholars um, were working with the Carmel of Lisieux to try to compile these letters. And I think that from my sense of reading the introduction, uh, the difficulty in, in the sisters not wanting to um, immediately disseminate all of the correspondence, they were always open to disseminating some of their letters from Therese, the ones that were most obviously doctrinal. Mm -hmm. um, but ones that were very mundane and ones that to them seemed very embarrassing mm -hmm. because they talked about humorous incidents, which to us are all the more endearing. Yeah. But for them, Therese was Therese, their sister first, mm -hmm. their sister in Carmel and their sister in the Martin family. To us, she's St. Therese first. So I think that perspective helps shed light on why for them it was awkward and why they were embarrassed at her spelling mistakes and her grammatical mistakes. Right. Whereas for us, that's just endearing. Yeah. But it, I imagine like publishing, sister. publishing like all of our text messages or emails. It'd yeah. Be, it'd be a rather embarrassing thing. Exactly. So, but eventually it, with a lot of discussion and over the years, um, Theresian scholars, including Andre Combs, especially who's mentioned in the introduction, were able to, um, have all of the letters published. And so now what we have is all of them. And, and like I said, not only the to and from Therese, but ones that were to and from others that, that mentioned Therese and have an important place for her. Mm -hmm. And I guess that publication wasn't until, I think, over 50 years since her, after her death. Yes. So like yes. 1947, maybe yes. around that time. So it really is, it's, it's significant that these are, um, were first first available in the lifetime of many many people who are our listeners today. Yeah, it's been a gradual it's been a gradual process of uh, revealing them, and it's it's impressive how much just based on the manuscripts of the story of soul, how much Therese um, grew in fame and how much her doctrine was spread. So it shows how effective those manuscripts are, and and it, some of our listeners might know that originally the manuscripts that were published were, were um, highly edited, in, highly edited um, from what Therese herself had written. And it wasn't until the mid 20th century that the unedited original authentic manuscripts of Therese were published, which is now what, what ICS publishes. Right. Um, and so, but it's impressive because you have saints like, like Edith Stein, Teresa Benedicta, was a devotee of Therese in the time where she would have been reading Therese's edited um, autobiography, and yet it it made an impact on her life. Elizabeth um, of the Trinity as well. Elizabeth of the Trinity also, but now we're just we're in a new era, I would say, of of Theresean devotion and and Theresean scholarship because now we possess her authentic, um, her authentic writings and this this resource of her letters, and. Um, 
Yeah, it's, it's wonderful. Yeah, I think there's a, in the introduction to this these set of letters, it talks about how the priest was trying to convince Celine, Therese's sister, to, to release all the letters and mm-hmm. how Celine thought that some of the things were just kind of trite. And he said, when it comes to St. Therese and her spiritual message, nothing is trite. Exactly. And I think that's really what speaks to us in our, in our own times is um, the way that the saints are, are like us, how they struggle like us, how they have concerns like us, how they joke around like us. Mm-hmm. Um, there's this full, when you read these, there's this full picture of like this, this beautiful, holy, uh, young French girl and, and the short life that she lived, but mm-hmm. a life that was devoted to Christ. Yes, yes. And I think that's mentioned in the introduction that, um, I believe it was Andre Combs said that what you have here is a is is like a map of grace working mm-hmm. in the saint's life. And so the fact that the church has canonized her and also declared her a, doc, uh, a doctor of the church, it that does make the small details of her life important because they're in the context of God God turning this woman into a saint for the whole church. Mm -hmm. And so it's important to know um, who her friends were and how she how she related to them and how she dealt with um, different personalities and and you have a lot of that in these letters. Mm -hmm. Yeah could you maybe give us some uh, do you have any specific examples of Maybe a way that Teresa's spirituality comes through through these letters. I, I don't know. Maybe it's less obvious reading Story of a Soul, yeah. but it's like really s- sticks out to you here. Well, one thing is, I think Therese, part of the reason I think Therese um, is a doctor of the church is because she did set out to teach. Once she was once she was given insight into her little way, and even as she was developing that spirituality mm-hmm. of of spiritual childhood she was given the grace also to teach it to others. And that starts with her own sisters in Carmel. And so for Therese, even though she didn't write a huge amount of letters and she didn't write to that many people, for her, I think letter writing was an apostolate. Um, There are other saints like St. Bernadette who also overlapped Therese in her lifetime. She wrote very few letters because it just wasn't her calling. Her mission was not to have a letter writing apostolate. But you see here, Therese, she's, she's comforting her sisters. She's encouraging her sisters. She, had, uh, she was um, assistant novice master during her time in Carmel. And so you see her writing letters of almost spiritual direction. And most of the letters are to her sister, Celine. Mm-hmm. Celine was probably the, the foremost Theresean disciple in her lifetime. Mm-hmm. Um, and so you, you have here... Um, Therese being a pedagogue and Therese, Therese teaching her little way. Um, they're not merely, um, they do include things like congratulations on your vows and making vows and encouragement on persevering and mm-hmm. a letter of thanks to her aunt for sending something to the monastery. But they also include her reflecting on events that were going on in each of those people's lives and applying her thought to it. And it's that thought that we want, that we're hoping to get at to, to nourish ourselves. Yeah. Yeah, I think another thing that strikes me is that the, um, she wrote, you know, Story of a Soul many years after the events that she's describing, mm-hmm. um, and for most of it. You know, she's reflecting back many years, whereas these letters are happening in real time. Mm-hmm. It's, mm-hmm. it's her living that spirituality. So you know you're getting kind of the, the authentic sort of message as she, as she's experiencing it. It's just so real, I think. Yes, yes. And some scholars have have tracked, you know, the development of her of her mm-hmm. thought using using the letters. The letters are very helpful for that because they can see how her thought developed and, and when she really arrived at the full understanding of, of spiritual childhood. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Are are there any um, of her the people that she corresponded with that particularly like strikes you? Yeah, I think, so in the last year or so of Therese's life, um, she was given permission by by Mother Marie de Gonzague to hold a correspondence with a seminarian, a French seminarian named um, Maurice Bellier. And he was looking to join a missionary um, society of priests who were going to Africa. Mm. And so she, corresp- and he was in his 20s, 
as was Therese. And so she corresponded with him, um, I think, around somewhere around 27 letters back and forth, um, 11 letters from him and, and a certain number from Therese. And those are, I think, a very special part of this, of this collection mm -hmm. um, because there you have a sustained dialogue. And it's different because it's not with her and her sister, one of her sisters. It's her and a, a person she's never met and never will meet during her lifetime. And so it's kind of the, the beginning of her, of her external mission, mm -hmm. you know. And also, um, Maurice Bellier struggled a lot. Mm -hmm. he, he really had a hard time in his vocation feeling um, just under the weight of a guilty conscience from his past life, which he had converted from. He had an image of God as, as um, vindictive, and it was a struggle for him. But Therese um, was teaching him her little way by showing him the mercy of God that she had experienced in her life and teaching him to become a spiritual child as well. Mm -hmm. And so that, that for, us to, for us to read that, we can put ourselves in the shoes of Maurice Bellier and, and have listened to Therese. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's great. I think it's, it's good too that, I mean, you mentioned first of all that so many of her letters were just to her own family mm -hmm. and her sisters that she lived with. And so in between those times of writing, there would be times when she saw them and there'd be further correspondence that we wouldn't have access to. Yeah. But that's the thing with, yeah, with Maurice, it's like everything that they ever communicated to one another is kind of contained in these letters. So you see the fullness of, of the relationship. Yes. Um, and I like what you said too, that we can, we can really step in and, and if it feels like Therese is speaking to us. Yes. And it helps that she mentions numerous times in that in that particular um, correspondence with Maurice Bellier that because her death is approaching and she knows mm -hmm. um, because it's the last year of her life when she's when she's very ill and so she's constantly reminding him that she will be with him and intercede for him and at one point he says well that's embarrassing for me because then you'll see on the other side you're going to see everything that goes on in my heart and you're going to know wow. just how much I do struggle with sin and she says on the contrary, you know, when I'm there, I'm just, I'm, I'll see that, but it, it won't, it won't stop me in the least from interceding for you. In, in fact, I'm only going to be more capable of being with you and supporting you. And I think that's wonderful for us now that Therese is canonized. And so many people I've, I've found who are devoted to Therese find there's a unique quality of like spiritual friendship with Therese. Mm -hmm. Like they, many people, um, sort of take Therese as more than just an intercessor, but like a friend in heaven, mm -hmm. somebody who they can count on. And I think that's because she puts her humility first in her writing. She had a great gift for just putting her littleness and her, you know, yeah, just her humility out in front so that she's very approachable. Yeah. And then she's constantly encouraging us that from heaven, she will drop, uh, drop flowers, you know, right. drop roses for us. So, yeah. yeah. In, in addition to her, uh, just spiritual wisdom that's contained in these letters. There are also sections that are just really entertaining. Yes. I remember like reading through and there's certain there are certain sections that are just real page turners, which is surprising because if you've ever tried to read the letters of um, St. Teresa of Avila, for example, uh, there, there there's some good ones, but it's really, it, it's hard to follow kind of a storyline. And one thing that's so great about this correspondence is it has, you know, like you said, the letters to and from Therese, yes. but also it fills in a lot um, the details, the context of what's happening. So like one example is when she went to Rome and, you know, she's, uh, begs before the Holy Father's feet to enter Carmel, uh, at a young age. Uh, there's all these letters that are, she's with her sister Celine, but there's all these letters that are going back to her sisters back home in the meantime. And so just highly entertaining. Uh, you feel like you're, again, you're just part of the experience, but are there any particular like entertaining, uh, letters that, that, that really, I don't know, bring, bring a smile to your face. Yes, yes, especially having, having been in Carmel for a few years, that, that adds another, another layer because she talks about things that happen in community life, which we can relate to, yeah. things that happened in recreation, you know, and so you have a sense of what, what is recreation. But yeah, there, there are many, and there are, there are um, notes also to the letters, you know, so the letters are placed in order. Uh, a letter she sent to Celine on this day in April, and then Celine's response back. But then in between, there will be notes from the editors, mm -hmm. and that those often help you give context too. So if I can pull, if I can pull one, yeah. Um, so in the in the section of like extracts, so letters that were 
um, neither from nor to Therese directly, but mention her. There's a really funny um, one here. So this is from Sister Marie of the Eucharist, who is Therese's cousin, mm -hmm. um, Marie Guren, and to her father, Monsieur Guren. And she says, if I had had the space, I would have told you the story of a thief in Carmel. Yesterday evening in the sacristy, Sister Therese of the Child Jesus, she was a sacristan there, heard movement in the room next to the one where she was. She came, so she heard movement there. She came looking for us. Five or six went armed, five or six nuns armed. You will laugh at our arms of defense, a broom, some forks, heavy sticks. Not seeing them return, Sister Maria of the Sacred Heart left me with tongs and shovels. There was one who had taken a fistful of ashes to throw on the head of the thief. So I just love this. This yes. I mean, how else could we know about about that scene in which happened and Therese was there for that? So there was a lot of joy in her in her life. I mean, that moment where they were terrified of a possible thief. I don't know if, why they thought there was a thief in the Carmel, but but that they took you know forks and and tongs to try to attack the thief is just is just delightful yes. story. Yeah, that's really good. Just just imagining Therese in that situation is, is really it's great. Yeah, it makes her very human. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I think so. That's good. Um, I don't know. Are there any other kind of like spiritual messages that you find, and or maybe just some specific ex examples from the letters? Sure. Yeah. Share? So I, so I wanted to I wanted to share one example. Um, so the first I would start. It helps to give context. So this is a letter from from Zelie Martin. So before she died, she died. Therese's when, mother. Therese's yeah. mother, Saint Zelie Martin, and she died when Therese was, I believe, four. 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 Yeah. And so this is, but this is a letter of the time when Therese is about three years old. And um, it gives helpful context. The reason I'm bringing it up is it gives helpful context for a letter that Therese writes in the last year of her life. Mm -hmm. You can see a great continuity. So Zelie says to her daughter, Pauline, one morning I wanted to kiss her, Therese, before going downstairs. She seemed to be in a deep sleep and I did not dare awaken her when Marie said to me, mama, she's pretending to sleep, I'm sure. Then I bent over her forehead to kiss her, but she hid immediately under her blanket, saying with the air of a spoiled child, I don't want anyone to see me. She's three, she's three years old. I was less than pleased and I made her feel it. So Zaley was upset with how Therese was acting. Two minutes later, I heard her crying and soon to my great surprise, I saw her at my side. She had left her little bed all by herself, had come down the stairs barefooted hampered by her nightgown, which was longer than herself. Her little face with, was bathed in tears. Mama, she said, throwing herself at my knees. Mama, I was naughty, pardon me. Pardon was qu quickly granted. I took my cherub in my arms, pressing her to my heart and covering her with kisses. So anybody who's read um, Story of a Soul will recognize there the, the father that Teresa talks about, I mean, I, that Therese talks about. And this is her mother, mm -hmm. but you can see here the roots of Therese's childlike trust in God because of the example given by her mother. Mm -hmm. So Therese here was naughty as a three-year-old, and you also see, you know, Therese, not all three-year-olds would get up and go beg forgiveness from their mother, but Therese did, and her mother responds with, with complete immediate forgiveness mm -hmm. and takes her cherub in her arms and covers her with kisses. Mm -hmm. So I think that that runs that theme obviously runs through Therese, but then going to a letter that Therese wrote in the last year of her life to um, Maurice Bellier, the seminarian, mm -hmm. she gives him this example. I would like to try to make you understand by means of a very simple comparison how much Jesus loves even imperfect souls who confide in him. I picture a father who has two children, mischievous and disobedient. And when he comes to punish them, he sees one of them who trembles and gets away from him in terror, having, however, in the bottom of his heart, the feeling that he deserves to be punished. His brother, on the contrary, throws himself into his father's arms, saying that he is sorry for having kissed, caused him any trouble, that he loves him, and that to prove it, he will be good from now on. And if this child asks his father to punish him with a kiss, I do not believe that the heart of the happy father could resist the filial confidence of this child, whose sincerity and love he knows. He realizes, however, 
that more than once his son will fall into the same faults, but he is prepared to pardon him always if his son always takes him by his heart. I say nothing to you about the first child, dear, dear little brother. You must know whether his father can love him as much and treat him with the same indulgence as the other. Mm. So it's just a, a sign of the work of Saints Louis and Zaley on, on St. Therese, I think. Yes. Yeah, yeah I've, I've heard it said that if we um, refuse to go to the Father for forgiveness, then the devil wins twice. Mm-hmm. He wins in our, our original sin, mm-hmm. but even more so in our, our refusal to just go running to the Father, yes. to lay the sin before him and to be swept up into his arms. Yes, which is which is exactly what Therese is teaching us there. Yes, yeah. Uh, so, um, I don't know, maybe we can end. Do you have any, uh, I don't know, a specific... Uh, way that Therese has touched your own life, your own vocation, or, um, yeah, just in, in general? Sure. Yeah, I think, so for me, Therese was my, my entry into Carmel. Mm. Um, it was reluctantly reading, starting to read her autobiography because I had heard about it and I, I thought maybe that's not for me, mm. you know, and, but I did, I went for it, um, and pretty much immediately realized how much was there. Mm-hmm. And also, I put a picture of Therese in my apartment, and she just became my friend. Mm-hmm. You know, I decided, I told her she could be my friend, and she gives us so much permission to do that. Mm-hmm. And so that was when I was discerning my vocation, you know, as a priest. And then it was easy to put two and two together and realize Therese belonged to a certain order. And what was that order? And so that's how I learned about the Discalced Carmelites and then came to learn about John of the Cross and Teresa and, and this province. Mm. Um, so I really have Therese to thank for for bringing me into Carmel, mm. um, for, for helping me very much with that. So she continues to be a source of inspiration for me. I always feel like um, she loves me more than I can love her. And that's encouraging, yeah. you know, that she she's loving me very well. Mm-hmm. All right, well, thank you very much, Brother Isaiah. It's great talking with you about this. Uh, we, we highly recommend these books to anyone who's listening. Therese's Letters uh, in, in two volumes. Right now, uh, volume one is actually out of stock, but you can still get it. It's available on Kindle, so you can still get it as an ebook. Um, but don't feel like you have to read them all in order either. So volume two actually has really a lot of the riches of a lot more of Therese's spirituality, probably. So um, you can also start with that one. That one is available on our website at icspublications.org. And you can put in the promo code CARMELCAST there, and you can save 40% on, on these books. So uh, we wish everyone a happy Advent, and we hope to see you back for our episode next week. God bless you. Thank you.